So before we pick up where we left off yesterday, there were two matters I wanted to go back to. Um, the first is in response to a question you asked, Dr. Foster, sir, um, about uh, the document that suggested one shift might produce 1,500, I can't remember if it was litres or kilograms, litres, I think, two shifts, 3,000, three shifts, 6,000, and you, um, uh, you asked a question about that. Grateful to a core participant for providing a document which might help explain that. D Dr. Foster's seen it this morning. Um, it's JEVA 00001119. And I'm just going to read the second, third, and fourth paragraphs. It's a document from probably 1977, um, sir, because it comes from a Department of Health uh, file from 1977. Sorry, Sally, could we go up one paragraph? Actually, can we, can we, can we get help us with the title? Thank you. So the title is Need for Shift Work at the Protein Fractionation Centre. And then I'm just going to read the second, third, and fourth paragraphs. The need for a 24-hour system can be explained in layman's terms as follows. In order to produce the products from plasma, it is necessary to heat, I think that's heat anyway, or test, not sure, equipment to a certain degree before the products can be produced. And before staff leave, the equipment must be cooled, which in all takes four hours. This means that in a normal day, only four hours are given to production. A change of staff after normal hours means that the equipment can be kept at the necessary temperature for a longer period. And full 24-hour coverage means that the equipment is producing constantly, and this could be continued from Monday to Friday, provided the staff worked in shifts. At present, the PFC works flexi hours, which means that the one shift is spread over slightly longer than eight hours. By dint of careful planning, Mr. Watt, the director, and his staff are able to get four hours or more production out of a shift. The remainder of the time is used in running up, running down, and cleaning. The production is presently 40 litres per hour, which is 160 litres per day or 800 litres per week. In fact, in some weeks, it's nearer 1,000 litres, but it's not always possible to maintain this high level. Working a 24-hour day on a three-shift basis, the theoretical production level is 960 litres per day equals 4,800 litres per week. The important point, therefore, is that even allowing for technical faults, it is estimated that on a 24-hour system, the output would be at least four times as much as a single shift, probably more. Um, do, do, Dr. Foster, does that, as an explanation, make sense to you as to why you can't simply look at a single shift and then multiply by three? It, uh, it does, actually, and, and it, it, it's very helpful to remind me of this. And I would like to say that flex, flex time system that we operated became particularly important in the preparation of factor eight. Because as I said yesterday, we started first thing in the morning and ran right through till, until we had the, free, the factor eight on the freeze dryer. And to do that, we, we actually needed this flexible working system, which operated by having what was called a, a, a core period from nine to five, which was the normal working hours, where people could come in early if they wanted and leave early if they wanted, and they could come in late if they wanted and leave late if they wanted. And it was by having people coming in early and leaving late that we could actually complete the factor rate in one working day. The important point about this is it was entirely voluntary. And if somebody said, well, I don't fancy coming in early tomorrow, then there's nothing the manager could do about it. It was all had to be done with agreement. And so the managers in production spent a great deal of time trying to get the staff, staff schedules arranged every week and almost every day, every day. And it was because it was on a voluntary basis. And a proper formal shift system would have, would have made life a lot easier for everybody. Um, and going back to the chair's question yesterday and the document we looked at yesterday, is it right to understand that the, the essential reason why the output from a three shifts may well be significantly more than three times the output from one shift is for the reason given here, that, that in one, a single shift you might only actually be producing output for four hours because That's of the correct. need to deal with the equipment in the way yes. described here. In the continuous system, you haven't got That's that right. extra it's time. It's not stop-start. Yeah. So does that assist in understanding or in answering the question? Yes. Uh, it, it, it certainly goes a very long way towards it. It doesn't quite explain um, why uh, two shifts should be double one shift. It doesn't, no. And it may um, be... But that may simply be a question of rounding up. Yes. Uh, and they, these are, I, I suspect, approximate figures. But it, it, um, 
it, there had to be some sort of time taken for something else which, which was saved uh, if, for it, for it to, to work. And we, uh, we, this is the best explanation we've got. If there's a better one, uh, then someone can tell us. Could, could I just comment on at the beginning here? It talks about heating the equipment, and I think that just means preparing the equipment. Thank you. Um, yes, it's always joy to my heart when the explanation is described as being in layman's terms, I must admit. <laughs> so it does make it easier to follow. Um, um, the, the only other question, really, is, is if uh, it, it were working uh, for a whole week, Monday to Friday, 24 hours continuously, when does it get cleaned? My understanding was that there, there would be a, a short break after, at, at the 24-hour point where you, you would stop it, clean it out, and start up again. And that would be important to, to, to be able to put boundaries around what you call a batch. So it's not so much continue us as continue L? It, it, it depends how you, how, how you, how you, how that's, um, what you're referring to. But it's, it's, it runs continuously for however many hours it runs, and then it stops and then it starts again. Yes. And does that involve cooling down and heating up or not? Uh, Only in the sense that it's cold it and fractionation, so you're carrying work out in the cold and you have to adjust the temperatures. Yes. Yes, it's the number of times that's happening, I think, is what's significant. Yes. The, 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 the number of stop-starts, essentially, well, uh, it seems to be what, what makes the difference. Um, do, Dr Foster, the, the other um, loose end, as it were, from yesterday, um, was in relation to the information that you re recall reading or learning from uh, minutes about Baxter. We provided you with a couple of sets of minutes yesterday. Were either of those the minutes you had in mind? Uh, I didn't see the point that I, would, I, I had remembered in, in either of those documents. Fine. Well, if, if you do identify the, the document that, that you think is the one that flagged this up in your mind, would you let the inquiry know? Okay. Thank you. Uh, if we can then just pick up and complete the set of correspondence that we were looking at yesterday. So if we go to WITN 6914017 and turn to page 53. So we have now a letter from you dated the 12th of October 1983 uh, to uh, Ms. Harper another health and safety officer with the ASTMS union. Um, it, it's apparent you've been sent papers relating to a, a meeting of the Advisory Committee on Dangerous Pathogens. I just want to pick up what you say at point three, um, where you comment on Appendix F in the papers you've been sent, and you say this. Obviously, Arthur Bloom's letter is intended to reassure haemophiliacs in the face of a certain amount so it's the bottom half of the page, so thank you, of press hysteria. Nevertheless, I found some of his statements surprising. Uh, and then the first uh, uh, of the statements that you comment on is this. Recent evidence indicates that in this respect, at any rate, concentrates prepared from British blood are not necessarily safer than those prepared in the United States. And your observation on that was this is a highly contentious statement as there is considerable evidence that products from paid donors are worse than those from unpaid donors. It is also irrelevant to the AIDS situation as this disease is much more advanced in the USA than elsewhere. Paid donors will make this imbalance even stronger. And then over the page, the second uh, comment from Professor Bloom's letter or com is, uh, sorry, the second extract from Professor Bloom's letter is in addition the importation of licensed blood products has always been strictly monitored and controlled. Your comment was, this is misleading. It suggests that there is some control of AIDS-contaminated lots. In the absence of any tests and with the policy outlined by Lord Glenarthur, then not only is there no control, but contaminated lots could enter the UK preferentially. Um, now, Dr Foster, you're the comments you've made there I think are self-explanatory on, on their face. So my question is this really, what, 
what, what was the purpose in particular of identifying um, or drawing these matters to the attention of the ASTMS? I have been sent the documents to comment on, and I just read through them and provided comments that I thought would, would, would be appropriate. And, and did you have any particular expectation as to what, if anything, the, the union might do with, with the observations you were making? Initially, I had approached, as we discussed yesterday, I had approached Gordon Craig because I thought PFC was, was not being util, could be, could util, could be more utilised. And it, it was only after that that I got involved in being sent all of these documents to, to assist um, Sheila McKechnie, who was assisting Clive Jenkins, and I just did my best to assist to assist them. And, and d d did you ever um, flag up with the, with the PFC, with Mr Watt or, 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 or Dr Cash, your concerns about the, the government line and what Lord Glen Arthur was saying and what the government were or weren't doing, or, or your concerns about the advice being given by Professor Bloom? No, I don't think I did. I was dealing specifically with, with um, the trade union and, of course, the, the, those um, members of staff weren't members of the trade union. Um, the next letter uh, on page 55 uh, is the, the letter then that I think um, was, uh, w again, we've, we've looked at uh, uh, in earlier hearings, it's the union, I think this is Clive Jenkins, writing back to Lord Glenarthur, in part using some of the information and comments you'd supplied. Don't need to look at that again because we've looked at it in earlier hearings. Um, but can we then turn, please, to page 67? This is a further letter from you uh, to Ms. McKechnie at the Union. This is the 23rd of January, 1984. And you're commenting on a, the, a further letter from Lord Glen Arthur. Um, the letter from Lord Glen Arthur, just to put it in context, is at page 63. So if we can just go back to that. Again, we've looked at it on a number of occasions, um, and, and we looked... Um, uh, I think it's some of it yesterday, but in any event, there's, there's the letter you're commenting on. So if we go back to paragraph, page 67, um, I just wanted to tease out a couple of the points and, and then uh, I'll ask you a couple of more general questions. So you say in point one under the heading, no conclusive evidence, I think Glenartha is just being pedantic. The essential point is that a risk of contracting AIDS from blood and or blood products is recognised to the extent that many agencies, e.g. governments, transfusion services, manufacturers, are all taking action. <clears throat> there are times when evidence is sufficiently strong that it's necessary to take action prior to scientific proof being absolute and certain. I'm sure this is commonplace uh, in the world of health and safety. Now, just pausing there, this was the observation you made at the time in January 1984 on the basis of everything that you did or didn't know at that point in time. Having looked back at this correspondence in subsequent years, Dr Foster, do you remain of the views set out here? In general terms, yes. Um, and then if we uh, go to the next paragraph, which is in relation to FDA regulations, uh, you said so you say that you agree with the Lord Glen Arthur's statement um, that products prepared from plasma collected in accordance with the new regulations may carry a small additional margin of safety. You say this, from this it follows that regulated USA products are clearly preferable to non-regulated products, but that the FDA regulations will not in themselves remove the risk. At best, they will only reduce the risk somewhat. I still believe that non-USA products using unpaid donors will have the lowest risk because the disease is so much more advanced in the USA. This may change, of course, if AIDS takes off in the UK, as most experts are now predicting. Uh, um, can you recall what it, information or predictions or expert views you had in mind in, in particular in making that last observation? I'm sorry, I can't remember that. But is it right to understand, however, it reflects a, a general 
understanding on your part by this time, January 1984, that this is not simply a problem for the states? Yes, that, I think that's true. Um, and then uh, there's an observation at the bottom of the page in relation to Elstree. Um, Lord Glenarvan had asserted that Elstree is capable of fractionating all the plasma currently available. Your response is this. This may well be the case, but it begs the question of plasma supply in England and Wales. To achieve self-sufficiency, a substantial increase in fresh frozen plasma is required about two to threefold. Much of this can be achieved by replacing whole blood usage with concentrated red cells. Hence, more plasma can be supplied from existing blood donations. It is conceivable that changes in practice like this are not being pursued at the moment in England and Wales because the transfusion centres have nowhere over the page to... Oh, no, it's not the next page. Thank you. Nowhere to send their extra plasma. They know exactly how much BPL can process. There are a number of other ways in which plasma supplies can be increased. And again, it's conceivable that nothing's being done because the BPL capacity problem is well known. Um, now, again, those are your general observations on perhaps things that could be done differently in England and Wales. You have told us in your statement, um, and, and we'll come on to it when we look at viral inactivation work, of the uh, informal communications and, and information sharing that took place between you and your scientific colleagues and Dr Smith and his colleagues. Uh, in, on broader issues like this, uh, about possible I issues, changes that could be made that might improve the plasma supply to Elstree, was that ever the subject of discussions between you and Dr Smith? No, it wasn't. I was concerned, I would say, entirely with research and development, not operational matters. Do you know whether anyone else within either the PFC or SNBTS more generally <coughs> was um, in, in a position to make these kind of suggestions, uh, perhaps to, to Dr Lane or, or, or to others within the, the, the blood transfusion service? O only Professor Cash is the person I, could, I would have thought of. Um, and then um, the last main point uh, relates to the PFC. Um, you provide some detailed responses there to Lord Glenarvan's observations about filling packaging storage and, and staffing. I'm, I'm not going to read through those. They, they, um, we can see them for ourselves. Um, and then I just wanted to ask you about your final comment in paragraph five. My major concern about Glenarthur's reply is that there's no indication that any positive steps are being taken, at least for the immediate future. Instead, there seems to be an air of fatalism, that nothing else can be done, therefore nothing is being done. Yet some questions do seem worth pursuing. Why is England so short of plasma? What can be done about it? What would it take to achieve more plasma? What would it take to bring PFC capacity up? Surely the DHSS should be investigating and costing these options with some urgency. Now, you were setting out these views at the time to your union. Was that with a hope or expectation that the union, through its parliamentary or other connections, would be able to raise these matters? Yes, that's correct. And do you, were you party to any discussions within either the PFC or SNBTS about this these bigger picture concerns that are described here? I don't think so, but I mean, as you know, and we talked about it yesterday, Mr. Watt and Professor Cash were, were absolutely doing their utmost to try to get PFC um, more, more integrated into the, to a kind of UK system, and they'd failed. So that was kind of a dead end, and I was taking this other avenue, if you like. D did, it, did it occur to you at the time to perhaps go to to, to, to Professor Cash and, um, and set out some of the wider concerns that, and, and thoughts that you had be, because you had, in addition to your own R&D work, your broader political, uh, sorry, union role, I should say, not political. D did it occur to you to, to express those views to Professor Cash? Would he, would he, was he the kind of director to whom you could, you could go and have those conversations? I think it would have been difficult because neither Professor Cash nor Mr. Watt were sympathetic to trade unions. And I think it would have been a difficult thing to do. Um, I don't think I need to look at any of the further correspondence. I just draw attention for the interest of those 
listening, um, page 74 of this, we, in fact, we will just look at it. I don't have a question for Dr. Foster, but it's just so that others see the document. Um, this is the, the final letter in this particular chain of correspondence, and it, it's from Ms. McKechnie at the Union to Dr. Foster, 10th of July, 1984. It's a comment in the second paragraph on the letter from the Minister John Mackay, which we looked at during the presentations um, and, and looked at briefly yesterday, uh, where she ca characterises John Mackay's letter as having a, a nationalistic attitude um, behind it. And I just, just flag that up if, if others are interested. Um, Dr Foster, I, I'm going to move on in, in a moment to a different topic. Is there anything further based upon your communications with the union and the discussions that were taking place, the range of observations you were making, um, that we haven't covered that's of any particular significance? No, I think those are all the key points. So the, the next topic I wanted to ask you about is, is about the question of the, the warnings and labels that were issued with PFC products. Um, now, as I understand it, that wasn't your particular area of responsibility within the PFC, is that right? That's correct. I'm going to ask you about it, however, because you did give evidence to, um, I think, both Archer and Penrose in relation to it, and there isn't anyone else necessarily I can ask <coughs> the same questions of. But before I do that, wh whose responsibility was the, 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 that, the, the content of the labels, package inserts, product warnings, and so on? It was primarily the director's responsibility but he carried that out in conjunction with the head of quality and also the production manager. So would that, obviously that would have involved um, Mr. Watt up until his departure in, um, I think, the end of 1983. Um, would that then also have involved Dr. Perry? Yes. Right, well, I can pick it up again with him hopefully next week in that case. But in the meantime, can we start with your Archer evidence, ARCH 609. And if we go to page 25, I think. So we looked at this passage yesterday in the context of uh, manufacturer's license and uh, the um, medicines inspectorate inspection. But if we just pick it up in the last four lines of the page, you referred there to the role of the product license, sometimes known as a marketing authorization, which demonstrates that a product has been judged to be suitable for the clinical use as specified. And then if we go over the page, you continue by referring to the role of the CSM, so the Committee on the Safety of Medicines. Um, and you say lines five to ten, so the CSM would also consider issues such as product quality and product composition the method of preparation, and this would include the labelling and packaging, and with regard to packaging, all pharmaceutical products must carry warnings of potential side effects or adverse reactions. And then if we pick it up at the bottom of the page, you say at line 21, to carry on, I believe that the warnings that went with products and the wording that was used in those warnings had to be improved by MHRA before a licence could be awarded. For example, SNBTS was first granted a product, go to the next page, licensed for factor eight concentrate in 1978. The packaging contained five warnings concerning the risk of hepatitis. There were two warnings on the outer cartoon, two warnings on the product information leaflet, and one warning on the label attached to each and every vial. The wording for these warnings was submitted with the application for the license and was approved by the MCA when the product license was granted. Uh, and then um, you refer to the position in relation to commercial concentrates and you set out your presumption that those uh, ha also had warnings and wordings that were approved by the MCA. Um, so that was in general terms the evidence you gave to the Archer Committee. Was that so the Archer inquiry, was that based upon your examination of documents, as far as you can recall, or upon the information provided to you by others within the PFC? It was my examination of documents. Well, well, what I just want to do then is, is look at um, the examples of, of product warnings that you then provided to the Penrose inquiry. 
That's PRSC 0002726, please. PRSC 0002726. Sorry, I think I put in an extra zero wrongly. Um, so this hepatitis risk warnings, if we go over the page, so if we go to page three. Um, we can see that there's some narrative um, summarising um, the various warnings and then over the page, the, the package inserts and the vial labels and the product packaging. So they're the various different locations, as it were, on the products where there might be warnings. And then if we can look at the actual examples that you provided, um, we start on page 10. Um, so this is uh, an application for a product license in relation to the PFC's factor eight product. If we look down the bottom of the page, we'll see the date, which is the 30th of March, 1978. And then if we go to the next page, um, just over halfway down the page, there's the heading contraindications. So it's paragraph 2.6. And so contraindications, precautions, and warnings. There are no contraindications. Warnings include storage below five degrees centigrade, et cetera, et cetera. And then the last sentence, products may carry the risk of transmitting serum hepatitis. Um, Dr. Foster, what I'm going to do is show you the various documents and then ask you some general questions. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to go through them before, before we talk about them. Um, so that, that's what's said in, in the actual application for a product license. If we then go to page 13... This is uh, the proposed package leaflet insert that was submitted with the product license, and we can pick it up in the second paragraph. All plasma used for preparation of factor eight concentrate is derived from blood collected from volunteer donors and has been screened for the presence of the HB surface uh, antigen, uh, and then it explains the, 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 the screening methods used. Nevertheless, none of these tests are of sufficient sensitivity to eliminate the possibility of transmitting hepatitis. Methods for examination of the product continue to be developed, but the risk of transmission cannot be disregarded. And then if we go over to the next page, and there's a heading, side effects, bottom of the page, thank you. Complications in the use of factor eight concentrate are rare, Apart from the general complications of hepatitis and intravascular hemolysis, hemolysis. hemolysis, see above, some patients may occasionally experience slight irritation at the site of injection. Transitory headache or nausea following the administration of factor eight concentrates also been reported. For individual patients, this appears to be related to a particular batch of the product. Um, so that's the, that application. Um, if we go to the next page, we just turn it round. We're able to. This is the same document in any event, but in relation to factor nine. Um, and the date is, I think, at the bottom of the page, October 1978. Thank you. Yeah, so we've got the date at the bottom, October 1978. If we go to the second page, and we go towards the bottom of the page, it's paragraph 2.6 again, contraindications, precautions, and warnings. Again, we can see similar terms to the factor eight product application uh, with the sentence product may carry the risk of transmitting serum hepatitis. Um, and then the next page, we, we can see introduces the proposed package leaflet insert for the factor nine product. And if we go over to page uh, 18, um, we, we've got in similar terms, the second paragraph, which refers to collection from volunteer donors, the screening for hepatitis B, and then the same sentence, nevertheless, none of these tests are of sufficient sensitivity to eliminate the possibility of transmitting hepatitis. 
methods for examination of the product continue to be developed, the risk of transmission cannot be disregarded. Uh, and then if we go to the following page, under the heading side effects, complications in the use of factor IX concentrate defects are rare, apart from the general complications of hepatitis, Products containing concentrations of coagulation factor IX have a well-documented reputation for causing diffuse intravascular coagulation or thrombosis at the injection site. And, and there's a further um, uh, uh, explanation in relation to that. So th those are the, the leaflets. If we go to the next page... Um, <clears throat> these are slightly harder to read. Um, but in any event, I think we'll see that they are essentially in very similar terms. Oh, no. I think if we leave it as it is, Sally, it's, 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 it's just about legible. So the second paragraph under the heading description, again, refers to the plasma being derived from volunteer donors, screening for the presence of hepatitis B, um, not of sufficient sensitivity to eliminate the possibility of transmitting hepatitis Methods for examination of the product continue to be developed, but risk of transmission cannot be disregarded. Um, and then the side effects, again, is in similar terms, referring to the general complications of hepatitis um, on the uh, bottom of the right-hand side. And then if we go to the next page, so that was in relation to the factor eight concentrate. If we go to the next page, this would appear to be the leaflet, or the, sorry, the, the insert for heat-treated factor eight, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, and then here we can see, uh, so this would be 1985? Uh, 5th, of, 5th of April, 1985. Oh, thank you, sir. Yes, bottom of the page, we have the date. Thank you. So we can see um, here it says in the second paragraph, well, there's reference to the four, up to, use of up to 4,000 donations of plasma. Yeah. Um, and then the second paragraph says... All plasma used for the preparation of factor eight concentrates derived from blood collected from volunteer donors has been screened for the presence of the HB surface antigen using a radio immunoassay, and the preparation has also been examined by more sensitive techniques applied in at least two laboratories. The product has been heat treated at 68 degrees for 24 hours in the dried state, but it cannot be assumed that the product is non-infective. Um, and then, if we go back to the whole screen, please, Sally. Side effects on the right-hand side, I, we can leave it as it is, I think, on the screen. Um, uh, under the heading side effects, complications in the use of factor eight concentrate are rare, apart from the general complications of hepatitis and intravascular hemolysis. Some patients may occasionally experience slight irritation at the site of injection, um, and then reference to transitory headache or nausea. Um, and then, uh, if we go over to the next page, just, just, yes. can we just go back a moment? Um, can, can you help uh, with the, the the words there? The product is um, just trying to find it. Yes, it's the second paragraph under description. All, all plasma used is derived from blood collected from volunteer donors and has been screened for the presence of the hepatitis B surface antigen using a radioimmunoassay. And the preparation has also been examined by more sensitive techniques applied in at least two laboratories. What techniques is that referring to that are more sensitive than radioimmunoassay at the time? I'm sorry, I... I I can't answer that. That's not my area of expertise. I, I don't understand what that means. Dr. Perry might be able to answer that. Yes. Yes, but it would be interesting to know. Yes, and I'll, um, no doubt um, we can uh, ensure that Dr. Perry is told in advance that um, we, we might want to ask him about this. Um, if we go to the next page, just to complete the picture in relation to this category of materials. We've got here um, the insert in relation to uh, factor nine, defix. So we can pick it up in the second paragraph under the heading description. 
um, or plasma used for the preparation of factor IX concentrators derived from blood collected from volunteer donors, has been screened for the presence of the hepatitis B surface antigen using radioimmunoassay, and the preparation has also been examined by more searching techniques applied in at least two laboratories external to the place of manufacture. So we, now, the, the wording there is slightly different. It is slightly different, yes, but the same reference to the um, more searching techniques. Nevertheless, none of these tests are of sufficient sensitivity to eliminate the possibility of transmitting hepatitis. Methods for examination of the product continue to be developed, but the risk of transmission cannot be disregarded. And then when we look at side effects on the right-hand side, complications in the use of factor VIII concentrate defects are rare, and then we see the reference to the general complications of hepatitis, and then the well-documented reputation for causing diffuse intravascular coagulation or thrombosis. Um, and then if we can go to the next page, we'll then see the, the document in relation to the heat-treated factor IX concentrate. I'm not sure whether we've got a legible date on this. Um, but in, in terms of the heat-treated factor IX concentrate, the earliest this is going to be is what, towards the end of 1985? That's correct. Um, and then we can see in relation to this, in the second paragraph, there is an express reference, which we haven't seen to date in any others, to, to um, 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 acquired immune deficiency syndrome. So if I just read that second paragraph on the left-hand side, um, all plasma used for the preparation of factor IX concentrates derived from blood collected from volunteer donors has been screened for the presence of hepatitis B surface antigen using a radio immunoassay. The preparation has also been examined for this antigen by more searching techniques applied in at least two laboratories. In addition, product plasma pools and individual plasma donations are tested for the presence of antibody to HTLV3. So I think that tells us this has got to be after October 1985 when HTLV3 screening was introduced. The product has been heat treated at 80 degrees centigrade for 72 hours in the freeze dried state. This treatment is expected to inactivate viruses associated with the acquired immune deficiency syndrome, HDLV3, LAV, ARV. The effect of this heat treatment on hepatitis B and hepatitis non A, non B has still to be elucidated, and therefore this product cannot be assumed to be non effective with regard to the hepatitis viruses. And then if we look at side effects, it says apart from the general complications of virus transmission discussed above, Products containing concentrations of coagulation factor IX have a well-documented reputation for causing disseminated intravascular coagulation or thrombosis at the injection site. Uh, and then there's reference to um, defects having a good, uh, unheated defects having had a good safety uh, record for products of that type um, and a suggestion that the heat-treated defects will be superior in that respect. Um, if we can then... I hope finally go over the page to the vial labels. Um, these are rather harder to read. I think we may have a typed up version somewhere. Can we just zoom in on the first one? Um, I, now this is the unheated factor rate. I don't is it, is, is it possible to see it more easily in the smaller yeah. version without the without it being enlarged? Not necessarily. No, it isn't. I think we've, let me just check because I think it was typed up in. Oh. Yes. Um, if we if we go back to page four of this document, the, the covering statement. Um, sets out the bottom half of the page vial labels. Um, this preparation is of human origin and cannot be assumed free of hepatitis virus. And um, that's from a label from 1984 for unheated factor eight. Uh, and then a 1985 label for the heated factor eight, the freeze dried product has been heat treated but cannot be assumed to be non-infective. And then the unheated factor nine, this preparation is of human origin and cannot be assumed free of hepatitis virus. And, and then the report um, from Dr. Foster is set out under the heading product packaging, uh, which um, I'll, I'll go to the, the actual copies of that in a moment, but sets out 
Um, preparation is of human origin, despite careful screening of donations, cannot be assumed to be free of hepatitis virus. Could I just say that the document that I sent to the archery inquiry was a, a, a better copy than this, oh. and it was a coloured version, and it must have been photocopied for the, by the Penrose inquiry, and so this is, this is a, an inferior copy to one that I could provide you with. Thank you, Dr Foster. Maybe we have the colour one elsewhere, I'll check. Um, um, and then in relation to that reference to product packaging, if we go to page 25... Um, th this is legible, so we can see there in the box in the bottom right-hand corner that the penultimate paragraph, this preparation is of human origin and despite careful screening of donations cannot be assumed to be free of hepatitis virus. Um, so th that's the information in labels, inserts and, and, and so on. Um, it, it, is it right then to understand, Dr Foster, that there's no... Um, and, until I think we get to the heat-treated factor 9 in, in late 1985, there is no specific reference to non-A, non-B hepatitis. That's correct, but nor does it talk about hepatitis B. It talks about hepatitis in general. It does, but in the context of a paragraph which, took, which describes the hepatitis B screening, so a reader might be taken to think that the warning that's being given is the warning of the slight possibility that's left of transmission of hepatitis B. It wouldn't, it wouldn't enable a reader to understand, looking at this alone, that there was another kind of hepatitis, would it? Um, I, I'm not really sure about that. I, I, do, I do say that, um, of course, the, these reflect the times that they were written in, and today they, they would be written in perhaps more clearly. Yes, and, and I understand, Dr Foster, you, you didn't... No, I have um, no role in this. have a role in the creation of these. Um, d would you agree, though, look, looking at them now, that to the extent that the warnings refer generally to hepatitis, there would be a risk they would be understood as referring to hepatitis B? Well, I think that's really a matter for it me, isn't it? Fair enough. Um, you, if, if you're right, it's a good point, but it's not one which is going to be helped by whether Dr Foster agrees Sorry. with it or, or not. Certainly, sir. Um, in relation to um, HIV AIDS, um, I think you indicated in your statement that it was only on seeing the Penrose report that you were aware of the position in relation to warnings or lack of warnings regarding uh, AIDS or HTLV3, is that That's correct? correct. Um, and do, We've seen um, that those were included, I think, for the first time in the course of 1985, using the term non-infective. Do you know why the phrase non-infective, rather than an express reference to AIDS or HTLV3, was used? No, I can't answer that. Uh, well, in that case, I'll, I'll pick those up further with Dr Perry and see whether um, he is able to assist... Um, in that regard. Um, can I then just turn to a couple of uh, issues in relation to cryoprecipitate next? D do you have any understanding of what the policy or approach in Scotland was to the use of cryoprecipitate generally in, in the 1970s or early 1980s? My understanding was that it was available on demand and whenever on any, any doctor requested it. Uh, and w w did, w were there ever any discussions that you were privy to um, once uh, uh, AIDS became uh, an area of concern about reverting to cryoprecipitate other than the, some of the references we've already picked up in, in, in memos about pe people might want to start using cryoprecipitate. I, I do remember a meeting, and it was in early 1984, it was a meeting with the Haemophilia Centre Directors and the Department, one of the, an, the annual meeting, and Professor Cash um, offered to, pro, to produce uh, more cryoprecipitate if that was thought to be helpful, and his offer was declined. But that wasn't reflected in the minute of the meeting as strongly as I remember it being said. 
Let's just look at that then. It's PRSC 0001556. We can see the date of the meeting is the 2nd of February 1984, and it's a meeting of SNBTS directors and haemophilia directors, um, and uh, we, there's representatives of SHHD there, indeed it's chaired by Dr. Bell, and we can see from the fifth line down that you were present. The discussion on cryoprecipitate is, I think, the discussion at page two, around halfway down the page, uh, Little Roman two, members discussed the suggestion that the production of cryoprecipitate could now be reduced. Dr. Ludlam said that cryoprecipitate was preferred in the treatment of children at present because of the new danger of AIDS. Dr. Han concurred. A policy seemed to be emerging, however, to use less cryo for haemophilia A patients. It was agreed that a certain minimal amount of cryo was required, and Dr. Cash pointed out that TDs, that's presumably transfusion directors, could produce it in emergencies. So those are the minutes. What's your recollection of the discussion at the meeting? My recollection is that Dr. Cash offered to produce considerably more cryoprecipitate if that would, would be, be of interest, but his offer was declined. Uh, so um, you, you understood it to be Dr. Cash saying that the transfusion directors could produce more cryo, um, and, and the, the general reception from the haemophilia centre directors was a, was a lack of interest? Yes. Uh, and then if we can go to your witness statement, please. So WITN 69140001. Um, if we go to page 126. Um, I want to just pick up a point at paragraph um, Roman 3, where you say, as well as fractionating FFP, PFC also fractionated the plasma that remained following the preparation of cryoprecipitate at regional transfusion centres, known as cryosupernatant. Therefore, with the exception of coagulation factor concentrates, all PFC products could have continued to be supplied by fractionating cryosupernatant. Is it right then to understand that uh, in terms of knock-on consequences of a greater production of cryoprecipitate, um, it, PFC would have been in a position to continue manufacturing uh, immunoglobulins and albumin? That's correct. Um, and then you observe in the following paragraph that there would need to have been a retention of supply of fresh frozen plasma for haemophilia B uh, production of factor nine. That's correct. Um, can I then just ask you uh, about what you say in subparagraph 5? You say, when plasma was in short supply, the provision of plasma for R&D was usually considered less important than meeting patients' needs. Therefore, a switch to cryoprecipitate would probably have had a negative impact on the development of virus inactivation. How, how much plasma was required for the virus inactivation work? Presumably a relatively small proportion of the overall supply. By 1983, we were beginning to scale, uh, scale up pasteurisation development work, and that was moving to quite much larger volumes of plasma, and I think that could, could have been curtailed if, if there had been a switch to cryo. Do, do you have a sense of what percentage of, um, of plasma received by PFC was then used by the, the R&D department? I'm afraid I don't. There was a point, that perhaps earlier, when we, we were so short of plasma for research that we actually encouraged our staff to become plasma for research donors to provide plasma specifically for research. And there were quite a few members of staff did that, including myself, and that was how we got our plasma for a period of time. So uh, pulling all those threads together, is it right to understand that from your perspective at the PFC, um, and, and your broader understanding from what Dr. Cash had said at the meeting in relation to SNBTS, there was n no impediment to uh, um, the production uh, of cryoprecipitate in the regional transfusion centres to a much greater extent rather than all the plasma coming to PFC. PFC would have continued to need a supply of plasma, um, uh, at some a more modest supply of plasma for the production of factor nine concentrates uh, and for the viral inactivation work. 
Yes, that's correct. Though I can't say to what extent the regional centres could have increased output, because that, that's not something I'm, I was familiar with. No. Um, uh, no, indeed. And, and we have heard evidence to, um, on, that, on that issue directly from a number of the centres. And then... Um, the, the next topic I wanted to come to in relation to cryoprecipitate is the freeze-dried cryoprecipitate. Uh, again, we've heard some evidence about this, but I just wanted to pick up a couple of documents um, in which, uh, to which you make a contribution. WITN 6914026, please. WITN 6914026. Um, so this is a presentation by you at a workshop on the 17th of October 1980 entitled Freeze-Dried Cryoprecipitate, a view from PFC. Um, and, and just before we look at the document, uh, We've heard elsewhere, but so that those listening can follow, freeze-dried cryoprecipitate was not produced by PFC. That's correct. It was produced at, at, the, at this point in time, it had been produced at the law hospital. That's correct. Uh, we don't, I think, need to go through the um, full set of, of presentation materials. Um, if we go to page 13... Um, I just wanted to ask you about this. So you set out your perception of some advantages and disadvantages of freeze-dried cryoprecipitate. Um, in relation to the advantages, you put high yield, doubtful, lower hepatitis risk, not now. Can I ask you to explain what you meant by those comments in brackets, first of all by reference to the yield, high yield being doubtful? Yes. Prior to this, one of the claims for freeze-dried cryo was that it had a much higher yield than the PFC factor VIII concentrate. But because of the advantages that I, or the advances I had made in increasing the yield of PFC, that difference became more marginal, and therefore the, that, that advantage of freeze-dried cryo, I, I considered there no longer to be as strong as it had been. Was there still some advantage in the sense that it was... Um, uh, it was a higher yield than was being produced at PFC, but, just n but that, the, that the extent of the disparity had narrowed? It's hard to make the comparison because it was difficult to measure the true yield of the freeze-dried cryo because you couldn't sample it as, as effectively as, as was required. And then lower hepatitis risk, your comment not now, what was that referring to? I've been trying to remember. It's, it's quite difficult. But I can only think of two things. The first is that the advantage of freeze-dried cryo over conventional cryo was its ease of use, and that was pointing towards it being used in home therapy. And I think by this time, it was appreciated that people on home therapy received a lot of treatment. I think the average patient with haemophilia was treated on average every two weeks or so, and therefore they were going to be exposed to large numbers of donations um, however you looked at it, and therefore the hepatitis risk um, reduction that was implied with, with, a, with this being used in home therapy um, didn't seem to make a great deal of, of sense because the patient was going to be exposed to large volumes of, uh, large numbers of donations, however, whichever way you looked at it. So is this right? You weren't there suggesting that freeze-dried cryoprecipitate did not have a lower hepatitis risk than a vial of factor VIII concentrate made from 4,000 donations. You were making the, is this right, this, or, you, or you think you might have been making the slightly different point that um, if you use lots and lots and lots of cryoprecipitate on a regular basis, uh, freeze-dried cryoprecipitate, you may eventually be exposed to non-A, non-B hepatitis. Was That's correct. And of course, that... Um, we, as, as, as we've talked about, uh, we also still had the um, standard cryoprecipitate for patients who weren't going to be repeat, treated very often. Um, and then you, you um, list a number of disadvantages on, on the right-hand side, um, which c culminate with um, a, a concern about the possibility of meeting 
GMP requirements. Was that related to the particular facilities at the, the law hospital? No, it, it, it did include that, but it went beyond that. And that the way the process was carried out did not conform with the GMP regulations set out by the Department of Health. And I think um, in my evidence to the Penrose inquiry, I said if there had been a real demand for this product, they may have kind of turned a blind eye to that, but that wasn't the situation. So it would, it would, if it had gone ahead, it would have had to be made in a way that didn't meet GMP requirements. But it would have had to kind of been given special authorization to do that. Was there a concern, either a conscious concern in your mind, or, or, or looking back, do you think there might have been an unconscious concern in your mind that if, um, if investment went into the production of freeze-dried cryoprecipitate, there might be less investment available for PFC? No, that wasn't a consideration. And then if we just pick up the picture in relation to freeze-dried cryo at a meeting at which you were at, PRSC 30181. I think that I might be missing a zero there. It should be four zeros, 181, Sunny, sorry. Uh, so this is a meeting of the 4th of March, 1981. Uh, uh, of haemophilia, the, sorry, the haemophilia and blood transfusion working group. C can you recall what the particular role of that group was? We had the annual meetings with the haemophilia directors and it was proposed that there should be a working, and that, as, a, as it says, that met only once a year. So there was a suggestion that there could be a working group that would meet more frequently to deal with specific topics. And this is one of those meetings. Okay. And did you usually attend, or were you there in place of Mr. Wolf? In, 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 in this meeting, it obviously it says I was there in place of Mr. Watt. There were other meetings where I, I attended in my own right. And then if we go over to the second page, we will see a heading, Production of Freeze-Dried Cryoprecipitate. The chairman invited Dr. Cash to comment on the proposal that freeze-dried cryoprecipitate be produced with a view to studying on a multi-centre basis its role in home therapy with specific emphasis on side effects, efficacy, practicability and cost. Dr Cash indicated that there were two factors in favour of cryoprecipitate, A, the increased yield and B, the increased pool size, although there was a school of thought in the UK that the larger pool size may increase the risk of hepatitis. Um, yes, sorry, it's so slightly, I'm not quite clear what's meant by Dr Cash's reference to the increased pool size being a factor in favour of cryoprecipitate. Um, in any event, um, it continues, he urged members to think carefully before embarking on a full-scale programme and to bear in mind the allergic reactions and side effects which could arise. The majority of home therapy patients had no problems when using cryoprecipitate, and in Belgium it was used extensively. Um, and then this, which is where your contribution came in, the chairman suggested that this could be a research and development project, but Dr Foster said... That, the, that PFC did not have resources for this at present. There was, however, a study being undertaken under a clinical licence for the Medicines Inspectorate in the west of Scotland, which was being extended to include children with the help of Dr Willoughby. Uh, Dr Ludlam expressed his interest in the treatment of children, particularly the need to protect them from the problems of liver disease and hepatitis. Um, and then um, uh, there's further reference in paragraph 10 to, to, to the trial. Um, I really just wanted to ask you about your own contribution there. Um, wh what was contemplated, as far as you can recall, in terms of a research and development project? I don't understand what, what that would have, would have entailed, because it wasn't something that we had done any, any, ever done any work on. It, if we had been asked to, to do work on it, it might have been to design a new facility or something like that. But when I gave this answer, that, that is actually very strictly it is correct, it's the truth, but it's not the whole truth. The whole truth was that the unit had been condemned by the medicines inspectors because I'd been present at the inspection in Glasgow when it, that took place, and that Professor Cash would have known that and Dr Mitchell would have known that. But for some reason, uh, the chair of this meeting, Dr MacDonald, didn't seem to be aware that this unit had been condemned by the medicines inspectors. It wasn't my place to point that out to them. There must have been some reason why he hadn't been told that by Professor Cash uh, Dr. Mitchell, and it seemed to me perhaps they were still in, under some kind of 
dialogue with the medicines inspectors, and that was the issue at heart, not any further research by PFC. Um, so for, for the transcript, I, I'm not going to ask Dr. Foster to look at, that, look at it because it's a meeting at which he wasn't present, but the decision to abandon freeze-dried cryoprecipitate um, was made at, finally at a meeting in January 1983, and it's a PRSC 301736. Um, can I move then to the, the autumn of 1984, um, Dr. Foster, and the um, realisation that a number of haemophilia patients treated with PFC product had been infected with HIV. Um, what's your recollection? Uh, so we can take that down. What's your recollection of how and when you learnt of that? I believe now that I learnt of that on, on the. It was, it was the Monday, maybe the, was it the 29th? On the Monday morning was my, the first I heard of it because I was sitting, my office was adjacent to that of Dr. Cuthbertson's, and we both had our office doors open, and he received a telephone call. I overheard the call and appreciated what, was, what that was about immediately. And uh, so that was my first knowledge that something uh, badly wrong had happened. Okay. And Dr. Cuthbertson was, uh, what was his role? He was head of equality at PFC. Um, so you... Uh, the, the 29th is the 29th of... October 1984. Thank you. And you've placed it as being that day, your statement says, because... You've referenced a meeting on the 26th of October 1984, um, which we'll just look at, I think. Um, it's PRSC 00001048. Um, so this is a heads of department meeting on the 26th of October 1984, chaired by Dr. Um, Perry, you were in attendance. Um, if we go to page three, there's a discussion towards the bottom of the page under the heading AIDS. Dr. Perry was concerned that there may be a possibility that PFC would be asked in the future what plans have been made to reduce AIDS infection in blood products. He proposed and it was agreed that it would be useful to collate all information and data on heat-treated products and that Dr. Cuthbertson, Dr. Foster, Dr. McLeod and Mr. McQuinnan should meet with him uh, to discuss um, this matter. Um, as I understand your statement, the point you are making is that if the information about the infection of the Edinburgh cohort had been known by the time of this meeting, you would expect it to be referenced in the meeting minute. That's correct. In, in, in any event, whatever the precise date... Um, on, on which you um, learnt this. Can you recall what the, what the response was on, on your own part or that of Dr Cuthbertson? What was the reaction to this? On, on that Monday morning, um, the first thing I did was to call Dr McLeod to my office to begin to work out what kind of um, studies we could do on dry heat treatment to extend... Um, any, any heating as far as possible uh, or make any changes to the product that would extend the dry heat treatment as far as possible. At this point in time, there was no production taking place at PFC because it was closed to, to do some um, building renovations to, to meet the medicines inspection requirements. And so we were not in a position to have plasma or factor eight to work with other than materials we already had available. And I'd been doing some research on how to reformulate factor eight with various additives. And we decided just to use everything that we had to try to work out if there was some way of um, enhancing any degree of heat treatment that could be applied. And we did make a discovery with that set, those samples that if we added a small amount of sucrose to the factor eight, we could heat it to, uh, at 68 degrees for 24 hours but we couldn't produce that immediately because there was no production taking place and that didn't begin until late January. So that was the formulation that we used from the beginning of late January to manufacture Factor 8. But before that happened, as a consequence of this meeting here, 
and doc Dr. Perry's suggestion that we should get together to talk about what, what data we had, it occurred to me that what we didn't know was what our current product would tolerate in the way of heat treatment. Previous studies on dry heat treatment had attempted to apply the, the method of, of, of Baxter, which was heating at 70, 60 degrees for 72 hours, and Dr. Cuthbertson had done that with Dr. Um, Dr. Pepper at the headquarters laboratory, and our product wouldn't tolerate those conditions. And we knew that, that around that time that that product continued to transmit hepatitis non A, non B. So it didn't seem a useful uh, route to go down. But shortly before this meeting, there had been a publication in the, in the Lancet by the Bayer Group where they had taken um, a mouse retrovirus and looked at 68 degree dry heating. And of course, by this time, it was known that it caused the agent that caused AIDS was a retrovirus. And so a mouse retrovirus was maybe some sort of model that might begin to reflect the heat sensitivity of the AIDS virus. And they, they had found that at 68 degrees, they were getting a much greater degree of heating activation than they had with the hepatitis virus. And so that seemed more promising, and it kind of opened up the possibility of dry heat treatment as an option. And so following this meeting here, I met with Mr. McQuillan, who's named here, and arranged with him to carry out a, a, a quick study to find out what degree of heat treatment our current product would, would tolerate at 68 degrees. And he gave me the results, I think, the following Tuesday, and it showed that from this small number of, of samples that he'd analyzed that it would tolerate heating at 68 degrees for three hours. And that was the information that I had when we went to the Groningen meeting that followed a few days later. And, and I'll pick up Groningen when we look at some of the, chronologically, at some of the, 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 the landmark um, events in relation to uh, heat treatment. Um, just sticking with the, the news that um, patients have been infected through a PFC product, do, do you have any recollection whether there was there a sense of shock um, within, on your part or those of your colleagues? It was a great sense of great shock amongst those people who were aware of it, but we kept the, the, the information strictly confidential because we thought it was important that it shouldn't leak out and before the patients were, were aware of what was happening. And, and can I ask you to look at your evidence for the Lindsay inquiry? L-I-N-D... 40320. If we go to page 10. No, sorry, page 12. Just wanted to pick it up. That's halfway down the page. The question was what happened in October of 1984? Can you just explain to us? And your answer, in October 84, we learned for the first time that there were patients in Edinburgh who were found to be HIV positive, uh, and these were people who were one of the early uses of HIV screening tests that had become available. And these individuals had only ever been treated with products manufactured by SMBTS, and so this told us that our blood supply was contaminated, and we didn't know that until this point. Question... Yes, and obviously I presume that was a very disquieting piece of information. Answer, it was disquieting. I mean, I think we knew it was just a matter of time, yes, but when that was going to happen, we didn't know, and it had happened. I just wanted to ask you about your observation there. I think we knew it was just a matter of time. That suggests that there was, in your mind at least, a sense of inevitability about this. Yes, and I think that relates back to some of the documents I wrote in 1983 where I said that you know, you couldn't, we couldn't exclude the UK from this. And um, it, I, I was increasingly aware that this was probably, just, as, a, as you say, just a matter of time. And, and you've said, I think, we knew it was just a matter of time. Who's the we that you're referring to there? I would say myself and my colleagues at PFC. And can you recall whether prior to this, this point in time in, in late October 1984, had there been um, 
actual discussions along the lines of, you know, we, we know this is going to happen or it's likely to happen, we just don't know when, or, or are you saying, we, well, I think we knew it was just a matter of time because that was what seemed obvious to you and you're assuming it seemed equally obvious to your colleagues? Well, I had put it in the memo that you, we looked at yesterday where I had suggested that we needed to consider the idea that our heat treat, if any heat treatment product was heat treated product was developed, it would have to apply to the, all of the production, not just a small part that was aimed at non-A, non-B for patients who only, only treated infrequently. So even at that point in time, the, the vision, if you like, was that this would be something we'd have to take account of for all of our factor eight. So I think even at that point, it, there was a sense that this was going to be coming. Now, I want to move then to viral and activation work. Um, we can take that down, thank you, Sally. Um, and, and if we can um, start by looking in general terms at how decisions were taken on what R&D projects to, to, uh, to be undertaken, we can pick that up by reference to your statement at WITN 69140001. Um, and uh, it's page 26, bottom half of the page. Um, this is in response to a question about um, how decisions were taken within PFC and particular decisions on which products should be pursued. And you've helpfully broken it down into different chronological periods. So um, one decision making within PFC was generally taken by the director in consultation with department heads. Two... When I was assigned to the role of head of R&D, uh, so that would have been in April 1974, is that right? That's correct. Dr. Smith gave me a list of all current R&D projects together with a brief status report for each project. Just pausing there, that list of current R&D projects as at April 1974, did it include any elements of, of viral inactivation work? No, it didn't. It did include viral removal work, but not inactivation. And what was the viral removal work? There was the polyethylene glycol precipitation method that was applied to Super 9, and then the um, polyelectrolyte procedure that was being developed with Dr Johnson. And, and are, are those both the projects that, that, amongst others, Sarah Middleton was involved with? And then um, uh, you then say from the period 1974 to 1982, decisions on which project, projects to be pursued and their relative priority were taken by the PFC scientific director, Mr. Watt, following verbal consultation with myself. So in, in, in that period from 1974 to 1982, can you recall in broad terms, we'll come on to some of the more, the, the more specifics, but in broad terms, the extent to which um, viral inactivation um, was, was given any particular priority? What was given, certainly in uppermost of Mr. Watt's mind, was the concept of how could we make products safe. I don't think that this, the concept of inactivation existed for um, the coagulation factor of products because they were so regarded as being so sensitive that they wouldn't tolerate the inactivation methods that were available. So Mr. Watt was very interested in any other procedures that could be applied, um, the physical procedures for separating viruses from products, and, and even the idea of um, producing factor eight in, in cell culture was, was considered and taken forward, but was overtaken by recombinant technology. And can you recall any particular areas of significant disagreement as between you as head of R&D and and Mr. Watt, in, in, in terms of the prioritisation that should be given to R&D projects? No, no. Um, then in the next paragraph, you explain um, the decision-making that was put into place from January 1982. Decisions on which projects to pursue at PFC in respect of coagulation factor concentrates were either confirmed or taken by Dr. Cash, who established a committee for this purpose named the Coagulation Factor Study Group. Do, do you know what was Dr. Cash's thinking in, in establishing this, this particular group? What, why a, a change in the way in which um, the, uh, decisions would be taken? Yes, I think he, he had, by this time he was aware that Berwin Verk had developed a pasteurised factor eight because he'd heard of that at the, at the meeting he'd attended in Bonn in, 19, in October 1980. 
I think he'd become increasingly aware of um, the extent to which hepatitis mm -hmm. was being transmitted from some publications from, this, from the Edinburgh, uh, southeast of Scotland, uh, haemophilia centre. And that, that maybe, it was also his own speciality was coagulation, so he, it kind of all came together. He was relatively new in the role of, of medical director, and in my view, this, this was part of his job to get on and do this. And then if we can go to PRSE 40428, please. So this, these are the minutes of a meeting of the Factor 8 study group, January 1984. And, and is this the study group to which you were referring in your... That's correct. ...in your statement? And then... If we look at the bottom of the page, Dr. Cash is recorded as saying this, it's in the last paragraph, before progressing to the reports received from the four subgroups, Dr. Cash felt it might be appropriate to consider the future need for the study group. He was of the opinion that the group had contributed work of great value to the SNBTS, but wondered if it could now be wound up with the possibility that one or two of the subgroups could continue to function. Um, and then, um, if we go over the page, the second paragraph is the opinion of the group was that it should continue to meet on an annual basis only for updating purposes, except in the case of untoward events when an extraordinary meeting could be arranged. And then if we go to the third page, um, towards the, the bottom half of the page, beneath the paragraph on hepatitis B, it says Dr. Cash proposed, in view of the fact that it had been decided to meet annually in future, that there should be re ongoing regular meetings between Dr. Foster, Dr. Perry, and Dr. Pepper on this general topic. However, Dr. Foster was quite happy with the current links between Dr. Cuthbertson and Dr. Pepper. Now, that, that seems to be a, a decision two years after this study group has been established for it to then function in a different way, meeting only annually. D do you recall what, why, given that this was a point in time at which you still didn't have a product that was a heat-treated product um, in use. What, why the decision was taken? I, I can't really answer that. I, I think perhaps Professor Cash had other priorities that were uh, occupying his time. I think we were a little bit disappointed that it, that, that it was kind of being, I wouldn't say run down, but it was taking a slightly lower priority than it had before. But all of this work was ongoing and the people were meeting all of the time, so it didn't make a great difference. Okay. Um, so I note the time. I, I can then pick up some of the more detailed issues relating to the viral inactivation work after the break, if I may. Uh, OK, well, let's have a break now uh, until quarter to, uh, quarter to 12.